first step of the operation. operation is to insert pins into the femur and tibia, which allow for fixation and stabilization of the trackers that communicate with the robot and the computer. Once I'm happy with the position of the trackers, a minimally invasive subvastus approach is made to access the medial compartment of the knee. As can be seen, the muscle belly of the vastus medialis can be seen at the top part of the wound and an L-shaped uh, capsulotomy is made to get access to the joint. Once I'm happy with the exposure, the next step is to register the center of the hip and center of the ankle. And this is done by putting the hip through a range of motion and documenting the position of the medial and lateral malleoli using the pointer. Next step is impacting in place the tibial and femoral checkpoints. These checkpoints are constant landmarks that we can always go back to to ensure that the tibial and femoral trackers have not been bumped or moved during the operation. The next crucial step is to match the 3D computer generated uh, image of the patient's knee to the patient's actual anatomy. This is done by registering anatomic landmarks uh, as shown on the screen and matching them on the patient's knee as closely as possible. A number of uh, landmarks uh, are taken throughout both the surfaces of the femur and tibia, They're spread out over a large surface area to get a very tight and accurate match between the two. The workflow will not allow the surgeon to progress unless a uh, less than 0.4 to 0.6 millimeter accuracy and match is achieved uh, between the model and the patient's uh, anatomy. The same process is repeated on the tibial side and once the registration process is finished, the computer then asks the surgeon to place the tip of the probe on those blue spheres as shown on the screen and this is yet another check to ensure that an accurate match has been achieved between the model and the patient's actual anatomy. Following this, my attention is turned once again back to the joint where I remove the excessive osteophytic bone using a sharp osteotone. What follows is probably the most crucial step in the operation. For an optimal outcome, it is paramount that the tension of the medial collateral ligament is restored throughout the entire range of motion of the knee. With this system, I'm able to measure the ligament tension by assessing the distraction of the medial joint space by applying a valgus distracting force to the knee in varying degrees of flexion. This is then depicted on the screen as a bar graph, and I can then adjust the amount of laxity or tightness of the ligament by adjusting the position of the implants or by reducing or increasing my femoral and tibial cuts. As you can see on the top right hand picture, uh, at the moment the extension gap is rather lax with medial joint opening of greater than three millimeters and the it is a bit too tight in flexion with opening of one millimeter or less. And over the next few seconds, you will see me making adjustments and changing the rotation and orientation of the prostheses to ensure a consistent medial opening of around uh, one and a half to two millimeters throughout the range of motion. One of the errors that can occur when a unicompartment knee replacement is performed without technology such as this is the anterior portion of the femoral component can be placed a little too proud of the joint surface which will cause the patella or the kneecap to then clunk and jump over this prominence causing clicking and pain for the patient. Here as you can see I can use a probe and run the probe over the junction of the prosthesis and the articular cartilage on the computer generated image to ensure that my prosthesis is sitting flush or even slightly uh, deep to the joint surface to prevent any uh, problems with patella tracking. After some initial fine tuning, the tension of the medial ligament and the opening of the medial joint line is tested once again.
the bar graph generated is further scrutinized to ensure an even and uniform opening of the medial joint space between 0 to 90 degrees of flexion. Currently, there is no other form of technology that allows us to combine the information regarding the patient's bony anatomy and ligament tension to position the prostheses in the most ideal orientation for improved function. This process of making adjustments and checking the ligament can be repeated as many times as necessary until the surgeon is completely happy with the final ligament tension and prosthetic sizing and alignment. Another unique feature about the system is that the, the computer-generated virtual model can show us how the tibial and femoral components are gliding and tracking past each other. The more closely the red dots are matched to the faint black line on the mid portion of the femoral component, the more ideal the tracking of the components and the more even distribution of forces on the polyethylene insert, which in turn reduces wear and improves longevity. Here, as can be seen, in flexion, the red dots are slightly too medial, and in extension, the red dots are slightly too lateral, and hence I move my femoral, the femoral component more medially and slightly externally rotated to achieve a more ideal tracking in this scenario. Once I'm happy with all the above parameters, the robotic arm and saw are brought in. The bony cuts are performed. As you can see from the screen on the right hand side, there's a green boundary or corridor that is set very closely around the bone that is designated to be cut. And this means that if I try to push the saw outside of that boundary, the saw will immediately stop working preventing me from inadvertently damaging some important soft tissue structures such as the medial collateral ligament or the posterior cruciate ligament. This is a very important inbuilt safety mechanism that allows us to safely perform this operation through a very small, minimally invasive approach. The proximal tibial cut and the posterior condylar bone are cut using a saw and as eventually you'll see, the distal femoral bone is removed using a high-speed burr. The advantage of a burr is that because of its small size, it is able to safely remove all the bone, all the while minimizing damage to the surrounding soft tissue structures, potentially reducing postoperative bleeding and pain. Once all the bony cuts had been completed, I felt that not enough bone had been removed from the proximal tibia. The beauty of this system is that, if needed, as little as one millimeter of bone can be removed from any bony surface at any given time. Here I was able to use uh, the accuracy and precision of the robot to go back and cut a further millimeter off the proximal tibia. Once all the bony cuts are completed, the remnant meniscal tissue and osteophytes are removed from the back of the knee and the posterior capsule of the knee, as can be seen, is infiltrated with local anesthetic, which greatly reduces postoperative pain and improves patient's postoperative journey and recovery. Subsequent to this, the trial tibial and femoral components are impacted in place and the trial liner is inserted. At this stage, the knee is then taken through a range of motion and the computer can inform the surgeon of the final alignment of the knee and the range of motion that has been achieved. Following this, the tension of the medial ligament and the opening of the medial joint line is checked one last time and allows the surgeon to make any final adjustments if required. As we can see from these images, the blue bar graphs are the ones that we uh, achieved earlier, and the orange bar graphs are the ones achieved with the trial components in place 
and there's a very close correlation between the two which means at this stage I can safely progress the operation without any further changes uh, needing to be made. The bony surfaces are washed and dried and the definitive components are secured in place using antibiotic impregnated uh, or special orthopedic cement. The excessive cement is removed. The definitive polyethylene liner is secured in place. The knee is then brought into extension and given a very thorough wash using a pulsatile lavage to remove any residual bony or cement fragments. A final check is made with the definitive implants in place to document the alignment, range of motion and the soft tissue tension. And once this is completed, the surgery comes to an end.